So uh, today's speaker is Dr. Alejandro Quevedo from the Universidad de Murcia in Spain. Uh, he is a uh, postdoctoral researcher at that same university. Uh, he hails, however, from Cartagena, which is in the same region about which he'll be speaking today. Um, he is a specialist in Roman ceramics. He's, in fact, here this semester working with me, helping us work out some uh, issues about the fabrics and uh, proveniences of some of the African amphoras, by which I mean from uh, Libya, Tunisia, and Algeria, uh, and one of the projects that I've been working on for a while. But I also see Yuan Zhang out here who's also worked on uh, with us. Um, he has uh, uh, been fortunate enough to get um, research appointments in all sorts of interesting places like Aix-en-Provence and uh, in Rome, and now here in Berkeley. Um, he has done field work in uh, Spain and North Africa and perhaps other places that I don't know about. <laughs> I guess you don't have to know all about all of those. Uh, today he's going to be speaking about his, uh, I guess, what's his PhD research effectively, yes, which is yes. uh, examining issues of the uh, urban development of his native city, Cartagena, uh, which is not to be confused with Cartagena in Colombia, yeah. uh, but which interestingly, <laughs> of course, it's Roman Carthago Nova, as he'll probably talk about. So New Carthage, but Carthage itself is Carthadasht in Punic, which means new city. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of new, new city. And I guess the Cartagena <laughs> in Colombia thus is the new, 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 new city. city. <laughs> uh, but he may be going into all that. I don't know. Uh, but uh, the issue is interesting because uh, uh, when we're trying to look at aspects of municipal life in the Roman imperial period, uh, in many parts of the Roman Empire, we enjoyed abundant uh, uh, textual evidence in the form of inscriptions, which informs quite a bit about municipal structures and, and personalities and things of that sort. Um, but as we get into the later part of the Roman Empire, or middle later part, uh, the epigraphic habit in many places begins to wane, and so a lot of the basic grist for your mill uh, becomes uh, less and less abundant, um, compelling us uh, to uh, shift from in historical archaeology to what becomes, in a sense, a prehistoric archaeology from some points of view. Um, and from looking at his abstract, I guess this is sort of one of the themes yeah. that Alejandro is going to develop uh, in the talk <coughs> he's going to uh, give today, which is going to focus on uh, how he is using Roman ceramics to uh, evaluate these sorts of uh, urban transformations in uh, the, uh, the city of, of Cartagena, Spain. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Alejandro uh, for our attention. Thank you so much, Ted. And um, first of all, I wanted to thank the ARF for this uh, wonderful possibility of being here today with, uh, with you. And also to the assistants, I'm very happy, very happy sorry, to be able to share some of the results of my research uh, with you. Um, I also wanted to publicly thank uh, Professor Ted Peña from Roma Material Culture Laboratory for his kindness and help uh, during this month in which I've been a uh, visiting scholar here. And I also wanted to apologize for my English, which is still terrible. So, in fact, I'm going to do something that I hate when I speak in public, which is to read. But I think it will be better for you and, and your ears, uh, believe me. So I've prepared for you a very, very visual uh, presentation. And I'm not going to insist too much on methodological uh, aspects. Uh, I just want you to understand the work I've done in recent years in uh, Cartagena, which is mainly based on uh, the analysis of material culture of Roman times. Mm -hmm. So take this uh, last uh, Maggie Brown talk of the year as a relaxing trip into the archaeology of a city of the Roman Empire. Well, the Roman, Roman Cartagonova, nowadays uh, Cartagena, where I was born, is a city located in the southeast of the Iberian Peninsula, in the region of Murcia. It's the same region where Charo, the popular actress, came from, which can give you an idea of why we have this common accent. So Cartago Nova is uh, located in the Roman province of uh, Hispania Quiterior, uh, later Hispania uh, Tarraconensis, in a strategic area very close to North Africa and on the road that links Cadix and the Atlantic world to the Italian peninsula. 
before we start, I'm going to give you some notions of the, about the historical context of the, of the city. Cartagena is officially founded in 227 before Christ by the Punics from Carthage, uh, who call it Carthadas, the new city. And as uh, Ted talked, uh, speaks before, uh, Cartago is a new city, so Carhadas is like new city, but then in, in Roman times will be Cartago Nova, which is the new, new city. So etymologically, it's not very, okay. So um, it, it was founded by the family of uh, Hannibal, and if you think on the Second Punic War, it was from here that the elephants go uh, by foot to Rome. So the city is uh, conquered by Rome by Scipio Africanus in uh, 209 and will become uh, Cartago Nova. Here it will begin its period of splendor. During the last centuries of the Republic and the first century AD, the city reached its maximum extension and its main public and private buildings were built. But at an indeterminate moment, from the, uh, from the end of the first century and during the second and the third centuries, a series of problems began to appear. So abandonments, distractions, this is the subject I am going to talk to you about. In the late times, uh, the city will uh, recover thanks to a new provincial reorganization created by Emperor Diocletian, and in Byzantine times, it will again uh, have a predominant role in a predominant role, sorry, in Western Mediterranean. So the territory of Cartagena is dry, desert-like in some areas, and with a road coastline. So why found a city here? So what were the resources of the territory? So basically three. First of all, the lead and silver mines. There are mines of Galena, it's a, a rock, from which uh, lead and silver are extracted, and they were very important in Punic and Roman times. At the end of the 19th century, they were exploited again, and here you can see on the left side the Roman ingots and the 19th century and 20th century ingots that are practically the, the same thing. Another essential factor is the harbor. It's one of the best, if not the best, in the Mediterranean. And I'm not saying this because I'm from Cartagena, but <laughs> because it has uh, a large size uh, which allow to host a military and a commercial fleet. In fact, classical authors speak about harbors in plural. Here you have to imagine the city uh, uh, that stood on that small uh, peninsula. So it has a natural depth, unlike, unlike other ports in the Iberian Levant that need to be dredged. See how ocean liners uh, um, dock directly even today. So in addition, it is naturally enclosed, protected uh, from the winds, by the mountains and by a small island, which is here at the entrance uh, of the bay, Scombreras. This island and its surroundings were also important for the production of salted fish, which will be another of the riches of the city. Escombreras, in fact, take the name of the mackerel, scombrus, that were, uh, that were fish uh, there. But in addition to salted fish, an important resource will be espartograss, which is a vegetable fever uh, widely used that will give the city the name of Cartago Spartaria during late antiquity. It grows naturally throughout the territory and the classical authors tell us that it was very used for strings, for example, for, for, example, for the navy, but presents the problem for us that its conservation in the archaeological record is very difficult, obviously. So it was also used for many everyday, uh, everyday objects. On the left, you have the modern ones, and those are Roman ones, a sandal, and uh, this is like it's to keep uh, water, and they are conserved in the Archaeological Museum of um, Cartagena. So all these elements that I have mentioned help to understand the richness of the city, but we are, so, we are also fortunate that Cartagena is one of the cities most cited by the authors, by the classical authors between the end of the Republic and the first century AD. 
So even Polivio visited uh, the city personally, leaving a precise topographical description that archaeology seems to confirm. If we take as reference another description, that of uh, Strabo, we see that it speaks to us about the silver mines, the silver mines, the fish, the fish salting industry, the walls, the fortifications, the lake, which is in the, in the north. And you have to imagine the city as a little peninsula. It's like uh, San Francisco, in, in fact. So here you have a, a paleotopographical reconstruction of what the landscape would be like in, in antiquity eh, with this lacus uh, in the north. And here is a current map of the city with uh, some of the main archaeological remains. We have the theater, the amphitheater, many domus, the forum uh, area. And here, an uh, idealized reconstruction of the city with the, the, harbor, the, the harbor and the theater, which is uh, probably the best known Roman building in, uh, in the city. The theater was built at the end of the first century BC by people linked to the exploitation of mines and with links to the imperial house too, uh, families such as the Postumi and the Uni. Here you have some uh, main images of the building that has been excavated during 20 years at the end of 20th uh, century. A museum was inaugurated in uh, 2008. You have this inscription devoted to the, the, um, uh, the family of uh, Augustus. And another interesting building is the Curia, which is the seat of the municipal government. Uh, as if we say the, the city hall. Okay. So among the elements that have helped to interpret, this, uh, to interpret it stand out its position in the forum and the design of its pavement that could have been used to distribute the chairs of the local magistrates. Magistrate, sorry. So we also have the, the Acropolis area and the forum currently under excavation in the center of the city, around the hill of El Molinete. It is so called because there is a, a molino. Molino is a windmill in the top of the, of the hill. You can see it here. So the results are being very spectacular. Uh, here you see a building that has been defined as the atrium building, probably a public space linked to a nearby temple. And you can see, for example, how the staircase that goes up to the first floor is still preserved. So here you have a 3D reconstruction of the floor plan of the building. And I show you also several, well, private domus that has been excavated at, as uh, Fortuna Domus and still preserved in a little museum. Okay, so we reach the second century AD, when uh, what Elena Ruiz called in 1997 the abandonment layers of Cartagena appear. It is a series of abandonment and rubbish dams that were detected in various parts of the city and affected buildings of all kinds, including dwellings and civic spaces. And you could say, well, uh, Alejandro, don't be dramatic. Uh, it's normal to find abandoned spaces uh, in the city. Uh, and that has, has nothing to do with the, the dynamism of the, of the city. We can see things like this even in Berkeley today or, or in San Francisco. OK, of course. But the problem is that we are, not, we are not talking about a case or two, but more than 50 in the whole city. So these levels were formed by the collapse of uh, urban structures, especially by the fall of the upper part of buildings or those more fragile structures such as adobe, as you can see here. I don't know if you call it adobe. Ado yeah, this, um, so you see, for example, this is Fortuna Domus. You have the lower part of the building built with stone, which is more resistant for, to the humidity, and the upper part that will collapse.
They have a characteristic orange color due to the above, and they also include a lot of rubbish. So in some cases, these levels can exceed two meters in height. And here is an example of a deposit that completely collapsed a road. Here you have another example where you, you can see clearly these, these layers now of abandonment. So the traditional hypothesis considered the possibility of an urban collapse from the end of the first century AD without explaining its causes, although it was raised that it could be due to an attack by the Maori uh, Berber tribes from North Africa. So the recession would have lasted a very long period between the second and third centuries AD. So how to study this period? From the middle of the first century AD, epigraphy decays and the references to classical authors disappear. The only possibility was to reanalyze the archaeological record and especially the pottery, which is the most abundant element in it. So for this purpose, I analyzed several excavations, but five sites in particular. I choose two types of uh, buildings, uh, public and private, to see if the same dynamic was observed, and I also, I also choose to work on old excavations. So the old excavations are complicated. The information is not always complete, but at the same time, it is a way of rescuing uh, these works from oblivion. You have to know that in Spain, which is like a federal state, uh, each region has the competencies in archaeology since the transition after Franco's death. So in cities like Cartagena, with 3,000 years of history, each excavation means new data, but many are not published, and the work that is not published does not exist. So as far as methodology is concerned, just I'll give you a few brief uh, notes. I carried out a global analysis taking into account all the pottery categories of fine ware, amphora, cooking ware, and I had quantifications. I know that this may seem very uh, normal to you or even very uh, even naive, no, but uh, in our case, which we began to develop a more systematic urban archaeology from the 80s, it's something that it has, it has not always been done. Uh, last but not least, I worried uh, that the data would be available to the reader so that he could make his own interpretations. So, for example, see, if we are dating, I don't know, this layer on 3rd century AD because we have this kind of, of amphora, and tomorrow we discover that the amphora is not from Spain but from Algeria and is dated from the 4th century, we can correct and reanalyze the information. But it's important that the reader could make this kind of, of exercise. So the global vision is important because in the case of Roman ceramics, there are productions that have been studied since the end of the 19th century, such as terra sigillata or amphoras, which interested scholars more for uh, their decoration or for having epigraphy. So less eye-catching productions have usually best been less studied. The problem of specialized in one kind of pottery as fine words arises when we only have, for example, common pottery. So these tombs were dated between the 1st and the 3rd century AD, so over a period of 300 years. Uh, but the empire, of course, was not the same in Augustus' time as it was in the Oclesians, just as uh, Lincoln's United States is not those of Donald Trump. So chronological precision is one of the first things that pottery allows us to, to nuance. I develop a typological and archaeometrical approach to analyze and characterize this context, reviewing systematically the material. And this is, is very important. I'm, I always get scared when I see publications on Roman pottery in which not a single fragment is drawn. And uh, it is essential to touch the material, and I'll give you three examples. Pieces from different layers that uh, come together, a published jar that was actually almost complete, it only had to be reconstructed, or Roman lamps that seem to have no stamp but were actually marked 
these are the same bottoms. So working conditions were very variable. I found it very tidy storehouse, other something less. I could even make new friends. But I think uh, we have all faced this kind of uh, problems in, uh, in archaeology. So let's look at a case of, of study. The abandonment of the site, Adomius, in the middle of the urban center had been dated in the middle of the second century AD from some fine pottery. It's the Hara Street. But an analysis of all the productions allowed to move the date towards the end of the second century, uh, the ends of the, the second century and the beginnings of the third century. So the analysis uh, also made possible to understand the formation of the context, a damp that was formed quickly as shown by the fragments of different levels that stick together. You know that when we are uh, digging uh, in the field, sometimes we distinguish many colors and different textures and we give a lot of levels, but it's later in the laboratory when we cut we can reorder this, this information and see if it's a same phenomena or something that was produced in, uh, in a, just in, in the same moment. So the same phenomenon happens at the Fortuna Domus. The majority of the rubbish damp context is made up of uh, fine and uh, cooking wares. I will not give you uh, many specific data, but it is interesting to point out, for example, the small number of amphorae, which are here, which are one of the pieces that, that most interest us archaeologists in tracing trade roads because they contain full stuff. And on the other hand, the high number of cooking wares from Africa is the middle, it is the 50% of the context, uh, which shows this intense connection with the other shore of the Mediterranean. So by studying all this context, we come to have a precise view of the production that were circulating at that time from dating and from dating in periods of two centuries, as the tombs I showed you before, we now date in periods of 25 or 30 years. So the same phenomenon as in previous cases can be found in the Roman theater or the Curia. The political heart of the city is abandoned and turned into a rubbish dump at the end of the second century AD. So notice how before becoming a garbage dump, the building is systematically plundered. Uh, they tear up the marble and recover all the elements they can. So the, the pieces that you can see, they couldn't took it because there, there were uh, under stones, but all the rest is systematically stolen. Even this, I don't know if you, this is a pavement in Opus Signinum, and they even stole all the rest to make another, another constructions. But if we continue, we find another example with a different chronology and in which the formation of the archaeological record is also different, as for example the excavation of uh, Cuatro Santos Street. So this excavation documented a humble dwelling from the 3rd century with uh, a small kitchen built in a 1st century AD shop. It's a, a taberna. So in this case, the pottery context was complete. So that is to say fragmented, but all the pieces could be reconstructed and presented traces of fire. So this is not obviously a context of abandonment, but a destruction one. Here you can see them in, in detail and they are complete. So once the archaeological evidence uh, had been reviewed, a new map could be made distinguishing between the abandonments at the end of the second, third century and the destruction layers of the second half of the third century. So with this new data and knowing that this period of recession did not begin at the end of the first century AD, 
an attempt has been made to find an explanation contrasting it with the different historical events of the moment. So if we observe the historical facts with which it is possible to relate this decline of the city, we have the important cessation of meaning activity and political factors such as a civil war between two supporters to occupy the imperial throne, Claudio Albino and Septimio Severo. We know that the province supported Claudio Albino, who lost, and that could have had consequences. There could have been other factors, such as the famous Antonin Plague, of which much has been said, although archaeologically it is difficult to prove. But are, there are elements that we can rule out from this scheme. So for example, in this period, sources speak of two attacks by the Maori, these Berber tribes of North Africa, uh, that would have attacked the coast of Betica and probably Hispania. Hispania Tarraconensis, of course. So there is nothing to draw such a conclusion from archaeological evidence. If we look at the transformation of buildings, we do not see any phenomenon that can be related to a violent event. Look, for example, at the Augusteum. So these missing slabs are not because of the Maori. Take them or one by one. Uh, it is the habitants of the city themselves who are retreating into the harbor area and, and wh they are who are dismantling the buildings uh, themselves. So more examples in the, we have more examples in the Fortuna Domus, where from the end of the second century, the spaces are divided, fire is made directly on the ground, and there is a gradual degradation of the building until it is definitively abandoned. So the atrium building near the forum is now divided and the atrium becomes a common courtyard and each of the large rooms becomes, uh, is transformed into a private dwelling. So the evidence of the pottery uh, context are crossed with other data. For example, analysis of lead pollution in the bay that demonstrate the cessation of meaning activity which drags the rest of the economy. It's around the second century AD. Commercial activity is also declining at this time as seem to show the shipwrecks eh, that falls from second century to the third one. And also political activity seems totally irrelevant in the city. If we look at the number of senators that the Hispanic provinces brought to Rome in the second century, we have two large groups, two large groups. So we have Taraco in Hispania Tarraconensis, which is the capital, and we have Italica, which is the city where the Emperor Trajan was born and also the family of Emperor Adrian. But none eh, is known from Cartagena, and that's very surprising. It could be thought that uh, there is a displacement of the population from the city to the countryside, but uh, it is not true earlier either. So the vast majority of rural establishments were also abandoned at the end of the second century AD. So the interpretation of these evidences is controversial and sometimes implies a conflict with epigraphy. For example, on one hand, we have the last inscription from uh, the third century dated in 235 and devoted to Julia Mamea, uh, the mother of Emperor Alexander Severus, which has been used to explain the vitality of the city institutions. But on the other hand, we have the local senate, the curia, which has become a dump since the end of the second century AD. So another example of this gradual degradation are the roads. Here you have an intervention that I made in the center of the city in which you can see how a white road from the first century AD becomes a narrow dirt road full of rubble in which two cars cannot circulate in the opposite direction. So the occupation of the city is not interrupted. Here you can see how a road is covered with earth and there are still traces of traffic through. 
but under which conditions? So this is important to nuance because sometimes two ambiguous exp expressions such as transformation are used. And yes, of course, everything is uh, constantly transform, uh, like uh, the energy if you want. But in this case, a recession is observed at all levels. In the case of the third century, the situation changes and we find a distractions layer in the second half of the century. Here we can speak for the third century of urban crisis. So using the word crisis as defined by Professor Gethal Feldi as a serious moment from which a sick person overcomes or dies. So a crisis is also something punctual. Uh, it cannot last a hundred years. So two hypotheses are proposed to explain these distractions in Cartagena. One is that of a possible earthquake. Uh, several city buildings have a, a major collapse as the Augusteum. Or for example, like the Roman theater uh, here on the, on the left. So these are buildings built uh, uh, with a very powerful structures in Opus Quadratum. So their collapse presents a peculiarity. The architectural elements are connected and oriented in the same way. Here you see an example from Bailo Claudia in the Betica, where you see this column affected by an earthquake too, it's uh, the Basilica, and you see how all the elements are connected. And uh, at the same time, all the, all the faults are oriented in the same direction. And you have to know that uh, when an earthquake occurs, the seismic wave sweeps the surface in the same direction. It is like uh, the wave that it is produced when uh, a stone is thrown into, into the water. So here you can see the, orienti or the orientation of the faults of the walls uh, of a, in the city of Lorca, where um, it's near from Cartagena, where uh, an, earthquake, an earthquake happens in 2011. So here you can see the Augustium again, so with this uh, east-west orientation collapse and the Roman theater uh, with the same orientation. But if you look carefully at the stratigraphy, you could see a lack uh, of previous maintenance. So I have already explained that since the end of the second century, there was an abandonment of certain spaces. So this is much more evident in the case of the uh, Augusteum. Here you see this column, uh, which is broken and displaced from its base. Uh, and why it is broken and displaced? Because this wall fault, uh, fell sorry, and uh, broke and displaced it. But why didn't he tear it down completely? Because a garbage dump cushioned the fall. So before the possible earthquake, the building already show a significant deterioration. But there is another hypothesis. For the second century, we have no evidence for an external attack. But now it's possible to speak of a raid by a barbaric people, the Franks, who we know came down from Germania and plundered Tarragona, among other cities, as attested by archaeology and writing sources. So theories about this type of uh, attack have varied a lot in recent years. And as you know, the history is like a, like a pendulum and it's uh, um, also subject to the facts of the present. So here I bring you two images that I like very much, uh, taken from uh, the book of Ward Perkins. We have a barbarian represented uh, before the World War II destroying and killing everything in his path uh, with this red-eyed horse. But notice how this image changes with the construction of the European Union and the integration of the different countries. No, but barbarians are our friends. Yeah, they are carrying on weapons, but just like an adornment. So look how, we are, how we're, they are happy and they smile to us. And of course, they contribute to culturally enrich the empire. So this 
happy version, if you want, has been adopted to the point of denying any kind of violent action of the part of barbarian groups. Of course, the destruction of a building, such as the Atrium building in the second half of the third century, may be due to an accidental fire, but all, option, all, all options must be, must, be must be considered. And we must not forget that the ancient world is a violent world. So, in any case, whether the barbarians or an earthquake, we are facing a phenomenon of widespread destruction that affects the entire city. So here is another view of the Atrium building. In, in any case, what is important is not so much the destruction itself, but the fact that the city does not have the capacity to rebuild these or other buildings. So even possible items uh, of value will not be recovered. So, in conclusion, in Cartagonova, the features that would define the late city were already visible in the Severan period, in view of the terminus postquem established by the study of numerous pottery contexts. At that moment, the ancient colony suffered a deep recession that affected both its economy and its extension, an unicum among the principal cities, cities of Hispania. So, although its urban decay should not be associated with that, that of its municipal institutions, their functioning is difficult to assess, particularly when the main representative body, the Curia, had been abandoned since the last decades of the second century AD. Some epigraphic discoveries, as the inscription dedicated to Julia Mamea, sh so showed the continuity of civil life, but uh, life during this period, but do not allow us to speak of urban vitality. There are a number of weighty arguments supporting the city's hypothetical decline. So the abandonment of important public and private spaces, as well as of numerous farm in its territorium, or the sharp drop in its commercial and mining activities. So these changes were exacerbated by a violent phenomenon in the last half of the third century. Neither an earthquake, nor a fire, nor a Frankish riot can be ruled out, which, far from bringing about ambiguous transformations, led, that, led to the renation of most of the ancient colony. Leaving aside its nature, these or those episodes were the coup de grace to a situation that had first uh, made itself felt at the end of the second century AD, after which the city showed no signs of recovery, unlike other Hispanic cities suffering episodic crises. The buildings that collapsed at the time were never repaired, nor were the household effects buried inside them recuperated. So the urban perimeter of the city will be reduced at this time, marked by the appearance of tombs, and will not be recovered until the 18th century. It would not be until well uh, into late antiquity, especially as from the 5th century AD, when the city re-emerged under a different urban model, although without the relevance or size that it had during the High Empire period. It had to look like this is some example uh, from uh, North Africa, more or less, in which you can see a new city totally different from the classical one and much more reduced from its original size. And uh, for my part, uh, this is all. If anyone is uh, especially interested, I have some work published in a proper English. And uh, even the PhD book, which is uh, in the UC library, but uh, in Spanish, unfortunately. So many thanks again, and happy holidays to everyone. Mm -hmm. I hope you understand more or less the... Which maybe, um, so it looks like they were scavenging and recycling the materials in yes. these major public buildings. Mm -hmm. And then you were saying that they, they, sh they shift them to a one location, and did they reuse these? Then? We found a building where they were stocking the, the uh, old material. And, and uh, near Cartagena in Alicante, we have even a shipwreck with reused material. Okay. So we have to think in, 
very organized people which is dismantling yeah. systematically these, these buildings. But, but they weren't using that to really rebuild buildings somewhere else in the city. Or, I mean, there's not that much yeah. evidence of that. Yeah, but uh, we have a little <coughs> evidence, but uh, they are not doing uh, public buildings or rich buildings, uh -huh. but we have more things like this, for example, this okay. new floor made uh -huh. with pieces of you know, colon or marble uh, slabs. But uh, for the moment, we don't have the evidence of, of important new building in okay. fourth century or whatever. Yeah, okay. No, that's a great talk. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Can you give us a sense of what the population was before and after this shift? Like, like what, what's the seating capacity of the theater or? The, the, the theater capacity, for example, uh, the theater is uh, one of the bigger in Spain. Uh, it's between 6,000 and 7,000, more or less. But the problem is that we, we start thinking that the city, that the first century city, it's really uh, overdimensioned. So we have the sensation that they built an enormous city, but after the meaning uh, cries, they have no capacity to, to, to occupy all the, all the, the space. Mm -hmm. So we have many necropolis, but with not a lot of tombs to, to calculate or to, to make uh, demographic uh, studies. And, and we don't know really how many people could uh, be. But because it's true that uh, we see that after the third century, the city reduced. If you see, for example, the, the fires of the 10th century are only concentrated here because after the second half of the second century, the city was concentrated between these two hills. But maybe there were more population in this little space. So I don't know. For example, when the, the atrium building is divided into four houses, is this occupied by, by more people? We, we don't know it. We, we have a lot of problems with this, this fish sauce uh, products because all, classical authors talk a lot about this, but we don't have evidence, at least for the first centuries of the empire. For late antiquity, yes, we know that they are produced, but not for the first, uh, for, from first to third century AD. And we don't know why. We are even thinking about uh, another um, containers in, in wood, maybe, or because they, they, they did show like barrels for sardines, and it, not in Cartagena, but in the north of Spain. And classical authors say that garum from Cartagonova is one of the most expensive in the empire. So maybe they were in little containers. For Channel number five is not in barrels, <laughs> but uh, because it's very expensive. So maybe, maybe it's, uh, I think it's Tito Livio who said that it cost uh, 1,000 coins of silver for uh, eight or nine liters. So I don't know. But I'm sure they have to produce, even if they produce a, a special, very high product, they have to have a normal one, so a, a standard production. But for the moment, we are not able to find it in the archaeological record. Is the galena being processed there in the area, or is it and turned into ore and sent around, or is the galena being shipped somewhere? The, 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 the ingots were shipped. They, they, they worked the material uh, in the mines. And we have the, the ingots in many points of the empire, from Algeria to, to Italy, especially to Italy and the Bonifacio Street. So we know they passed between Sardinia and, and Kors uh, to reach uh, Rome. Yeah. Uh, the two Marius. I noticed you also have a note on plague question mark. So I'm wondering if you could speak about the possibility of plague like. The uh, about the what? Sorry. I, uh, the, the plague note that you have there. The Antonine plague. Yeah. Ah, the Antonine plague. Well, we know from the sources, but this is something um, that it's well known, especially for the, the the Oriental side of the empire, that there is a plague. So there is this kind of disease that provoke a lot of die, a lot of deaths in the empire, and it is always cited as a possible element. But we don't have tombs or uh, deaths to analyze. I don't know to to make paleoanthropological uh, studies. So yeah, it's something that could be 
mm, consider that, uh, for example, if we look at uh, chronicles from modern times, we see that this kind of lake, which is in the north of the city, with the mosquitoes, every September or every after summer, we always have in 16th and 17th century a peak of deaths in the city caused by malaria and this kind of uh, diseases. But we don't know if a disease as the Antonin plague that happened in the middle of the second century could arrive to uh, a city as, as Cartagena. It's true that it's a port, so it's connected with the rest of the Mediterranean. It could be, but for the moment we don't have any evidence of that. Can you speak about what the evidence is in, in the regional mines for either continuity or decline? In the intensity of, of production of, of metal in the third century. I mean, presumably, when people are trying to account for this, they must consider the uh, the role of mine, mining, right? So yeah. Mining, mining. I mean, is what 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 does the archaeology show? The the generally, it declines in the third century in, in Spain. No. But yeah, yeah. But the problem of mining are are two. So. The, the data we have for the moment, it's uh, thanks to this kind of analysis of the, the, the metal pollution in the bay. But I, as I said before, the, the minings were um, reactivated at the end of the 19th century. So we thought that they were abandoned in, the, in Roman times because they were, how you say it, so they were empty or they were um, exhausted. But when they, uh, in, in 18th, uh, it's 19, no, 1833, they find a new filon of, of metals. So they start exploding it again, and they destroy all the Roman evidences. So we, unfortunately, have a few little um, uh, documents or information from, from mining activity. In fact, this kind of... Uh, Objects, for example, these. These were found in mining galleries in that, that they discovered in, in 19th century, and they are preserved. Cartagena is a very humid uh, climate, but in the galleries there, is, there are dry conditions, and there this kind of products were uh, preserved. But uh, we almost have nothing about the, the mining production or the decline. What it's sure is that the, the city and the region have more resources. So what happens with the other ones? So with the spartograss or the fish salting or mining uh, stops, there are no other activities that could be exploded. The so. only new wall uh, which is built and we have the evidence is in the 6th century during Byzantine uh, period. We have an inscription uh, where we know that he said he was rebuilt. So there is a, a, a wall uh, very well known from a Republican time, but we don't know if in the 3rd century effectively when the city reduced we have a new, a new wall. We don't know. We don't know if the city has the capacity of build a new, a new, a new wall. As you see, it's, it's very reduced. We have a lot of problems. We don't have any civic center or political center for the third, fourth, and even fifth century. And in theory, we became new capital after Diocletian's reorganization. But where is the governor and all the people who was with the governor? And where are all these buildings and and? This is spaces, we don't have nothing. So one explanation is that the, the, the power moves to other cities, as for example Elche, with each uh, a city very close, or even it's the moment in which it starts to move to the center of the country, to Toledo, who will be, who will be the, the, the next powerful city in the fifth century, and it's still in the same province. And we have very, very few coins in the, in the city. It's really strange. So it's for that that pottery is so important because no epigraphy. And we have just isolated 
findings of uh, coins that show us as a circulation of people and give us some chronology, but we cannot even make studies about, I don't know, uh, military people, for example, that came or things. So there are no wells, for example, that they Not, not. Just one uh, from the middle of the third century in the Augusteum. I think the last coin was from Voluciano, is 251 or something like this, but it's a very isolated case. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for the very instructive lesson. Um, so one of the things that um, I'm astonished by um, is the absolute absence of senators from uh, of senators. Ah, senator. Yeah, yeah, of course. And can, which is a, a huge contrast with uh, Tarago, for example. Mm -hmm. And I assume that if you extend this research to the equities it will be the same thing. Yes. So, um, in which, I mean, the, the number of senators and equities is usually a sign of the um, landed wealth, you know, the, the robustness of, of the landed aristocracy of the city, right? And if you look at um, the cities of Napoleon Nancy's, for example, in the first century, they are generated, the big ones, they are generated mm -hmm. a lot of interest and equities. And so, on the one hand, there's none of them, mm. none of the senators. On the other hand, from you know your, your presentation, it's clear that um, it's a highly Romanized and rich city. It's yeah. not a huge theater, for example. That says something. And from you know just the ruins. So I was wondering, um, how should we account for this contrast? Whether it's it's very strange. So at the first, we thought, well, maybe they promoted and they just went to Rome or to other power, to other centers of, of power. Uh, we could think too that maybe it's just that we didn't find the archaeological remains, or that the new city is a city which is still occupied. I don't know that are remains that get lost. But if you look at little cities in the center as Segobriga, well, this, this is from 2003. Segobriga is a very little town in the middle of Spain. Now it has eight senators. So, and a city as Cartagena, and uh, we, we really don't know how to explain this phenomenon. From the Republican times, we have the most important epigraphical collection of whole Spain. And, and we have a lot of important names, even these authors that visited the city. The, the, the exploitation of the mines were linked with the imperial house, even with Agrippa. But we don't understand how all these families could just disappear in the, in the, at the end of the second century or the third. Is there any evidence for continuity or discontinuity in the use of the harbor? The harbor is, is still used because it's the, the entrance, not only of Cartagena, but of all the province, even until Segobriga, Toledo. So it is still open, but uh, um, not, in, uh, 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 at, for example, if we saw the, the stratigraphical uh, excavation of the, of the harbor, we have still potteries of this period, but not in a massive quantities, and that's, it's strange that, for example, if you think in Cartagena in, in medieval times, when we have, uh, when Granada, which is here, is conquered by the, the, the Catholic uh, kings, the, the, how do you call it, the sarcophage? The, of the, when, when someone dies, the, sar the sarcophagus of the, of the Catholic kings, which is made in Carrara marble, came from Italy, enters by Cartagena, and goes until Granada. And Cartagena at that time is, and 5,000 people town, so it's like a little village. But the, the port, the harbor is still, uh, and, and we, we thought that maybe the taxis of the harbor, it's one of the elements that allow the city to, to, still, uh, to be still alive. The Kiwitas, uh, I didn't put you. How big is it compared to other? It's quite big, so. Uh, yeah, it's very big. I'm sorry, I didn't put you. Uh, uh, I should put this. And uh, not, sh uh, not shadow. Uh, so uh, here you have Cartagonova, yeah. 
And the next important city, you see this river is the, the Segura River, actually. It's the Tadar River in antiquity. So after the Tadar River, you have uh, Elche, Iliki, which is another important city with a, a harbor, uh, Portus Iliquitanus, it's Santa Pola. Uh, but Cartago Nova controlled all this territory until here. Here you have modern Mazarrón, that should depend on Cartago Nova. So it's a huge territory called the, the Campus Spartarius for this Sparta, so it's a, a, a very important region. And this kind of Baetica, the Oriental Baetica, is like a deserted zone, so there are, it, it's the main city in all the region. And after the Diocletian uh, new division of the, the provinces of the empire, in theory we are the capital of, the Terraconensis was all of this, so after when we will became the province of Carthaginensis, will be the capital of all this space. So even the Balearian islands depend on us for the justice or for this kind of uh, question. So Cartagonova, in theory, ruled over uh, an enormous territory, but it does not, not correspond with the archaeological reality, at least for the end of the second century and the, the third century. Okay. okay well, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>